We're going to look at John Donne's holy sonnets today, often also des described as divine meditations. Uh, it is a sequence of 19 poems published uh, like so many of his poems in 1633, so two years after his death, uh, written in the style which was established in the Italian Renaissance by Francesco Petrarch, namely the sonnet form. This is a, a very modern form. I mean, for us, it's medieval, but it's not uh, what we would regard as a classical form. It was invented in the Renaissance and in Petrarch's uh, form, it's written in the form of two quatrains uh, followed by a sestet. So two times four plus uh, six lines at the end. Um, prior to uh, Dunn's use of it, it was written um, or, or borrowed by both Edmund Spencer uh, and also famously by William Shakespeare, who made some innovations to the form, making it a little more, more flexible. Um, so he wrote, wrote in uh, three quatrains and a rhyming couplet at the end. We'll see that Dunn includes rhyming couplets in his uh, sonnets, but in general, he does follow the Petrarchan model here. So there is the form itself. Now a sonnet, um, has connotations of being a little room. And if these are the divine sonnets, uh, writing about God uh, in, in scripture, it says, uh, at least in the King James version, that um, in the Father's uh, mansion, there are many rooms, says Jesus. Uh, these are little rooms in the that are providing us windows into the mansion uh, that God uh, provides for his uh, people. Um, and what we can see here in this sonnet sequence is uh, an interesting progression of themes. And to some degree, it does matter what order one uh, reads them as well. Uh, and so amongst scholars, uh, we're not going to make too much of it here. Uh, but amongst scholars, there's a debate over where, uh, which, which sonnet belongs where. Um, if you're looking for a summary of that, you, you could probably go to Wikipedia and uh, it would give you a, a rough summary of that. In general, modern scholars follow uh, Herbert Grierson's edition in 1912, and that's the edition uh, or the sequence that, that I will be following here. Uh, we're going to look at sonnets, uh, beginning with sonnet five. Um, but I'm not going to um, uh, only use, make reference to that. I think I'm going to start by, by mentioning the very first sonnet, uh, just to give a sense of where it all begins. Now, the first poem was actually omitted in the 1633 edition of the poems, but it is contained in the original sequence, the Stowe sequence, and also the Westmoreland manuscript. Uh, and was the first poem dealt with by Grierson. Let me put that first sonnet up and just talk about the subject matter here. Let's see if I can, uh, two seconds here, give you the share screen so that you can read it along with me. I'm not gonna give you an analysis of it, but it begins with the lines, thou hast made me and shall thy work decay? Repair me now for now mine end doth haste I run to death, and death meets me as fast, and all my pleasures are like yesterday. So we can see uh, in the very beginning of the sonnet sequence a meditation upon uh, the theme of death and the imminence of death, and that he approaches death, and not only does he approach it, but it approaches him. And death is personified in a sense that presents death as an enemy. Um, and in doing this, um, I think that Dunn is following a well-established theological understanding in Christian um, theology that death is not something that just happens naturally. It's not something to be received with equanimity or as uh, part of the circle of life, as it's spoken of in Disney 
uh, movies these days, but rather is something that is hostile to our nature and is the consequence of, of sin. Uh, and it's pronounced as such. Now, it's for John Milton in his Paradise Lost to present death literally, literally in a personified form and sin likewise. But we can already see it also in, in the medieval imagination being used in plays like Every Man, where death, death is also personified. Um, in both cases, they are embellishing the scriptural account um, to give death a persona. Um, but obviously, for dramatic purposes, it's highly effective, and it does have a sense of the enmity that comes uh, from death uh, as a consequence of sin. But as I said, I'm not going to uh, read or handle the first four sonnets. I'm going to move to the fifth sonnet, the one that is uh, in our books. And we will find that it picks up upon the theme of death, yes, but employs his uh, one of his favorite uh, figurative uh, designs for uh, clothing his thought, that of the, the uh, microcosm. And he's going to compare his body to a world. Sometimes he compares a world to the macrocosmos, the cosmic view. Um, but in each case, it's an understanding that the parts and the whole are united in similar sorts of ways. Um, but so let me read the fifth uh, sonnet here, and I will put it up on your screen. There we go. I am a little world made cunningly of elements and an angelic sprite but black sin hath betrayed to endless night my world's both parts, and oh, both parts must die. You which beyond that heaven which was most high have found new spheres, and of new lands can write poor new seas in mine eyes, that so I might drown my world with my weeping earnestly, or wash it if it must be drowned no more. But oh, it must be burnt. Alas, the fire of lust and envy have burnt it heretofore and made it fouler. Let their flames retire and burn me, O Lord, with a fiery zeal of thee in thy house, which doth in eating heal. And in the last line, we uh, hear the echoes of Psalm 69. For the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. Psalm 69, verse 9. We're going to find that throughout this entire uh, fifth sonnet, there are echoes of scripture, but of course also uh, references to the uh, Elizabethan world picture that I introduced at the outset of the course. But first of all, the reference to, let me put this back up, the idea of the microcosm. Uh, which he almost literally presents here, I am a little world made cunningly of elements. What elements? The four elements, earth, air, fire, and water. If we were looking at the picture of the cosmo cosmos on our screens, uh, we would see that the, the uh, cartographers present this as the earth with water on it and the air above it and fire, a realm of fire above that. And those same four elements are, are contained in the human body and uh, exhibit themselves in the terms, in the forms of the humors, which give rise to different psychological dispositions and are, are under the influence of various planets and so forth. So it's a very interestingly calibrated system of relationships, which results in not only uh, a unity because everything's comprised of the same four elements, but also the diversity uh, of, differences of character and personality and and shape and size and so forth but he says what is in common here i am a little world made cunningly of elements but also a fifth element and this is something that is not like the others an angelic sprite or spirit and that is a spirit which is shared in common with uh between the angels and man namely that of his reason Angels also have the capacity for reasoning. Uh, they do not bear the image of God, but they have this particular capacity of reasoning. And the problem in both cases is that 
black sin has betrayed to endless night my world's both parts so both the physical of elements that i mentioned and the rational element has also been betrayed and both parts must die quite powerful ending to the first quatrain here and note that he is writing here uh, in terms of um, if we looked at the the rhyme scheme here uh, the cunning lee does not get picked up again until the eighth one two three four five six seven eight the eighth line and in between that we can see that there is a a, a strong ending uh, repeatedly by the rhyme scheme the sprite night die high right so a b b c c b uh, b a very interesting structure um, and and a sort of a uh, a book ending with the word lee but note that even when it concludes there uh, in the eighth line with the octave it runs it runs forward it doesn't actually come to a full conclusion until the ninth line and then it comes to end the ending and what, what we see as a colon here on our page and only then does it actually stop so it, it actually it's not in jammed but the movement of the octave bleeds to some degree into the sestet now this sort of formal um overrun um reflects the chaos that ha has been introduced into the idea of this little world which is a cosmos perfect unto itself but nonetheless is disrupted by the presence of sin black sin at that uh, and the blackness and the sin are both receiving strong metrical emphasis here. And this, this theme of the invasion of sin and the consequence and the disruption is one that he is going to particularly emphasize in this particular sonnet. And he will carry that through into subsequent sonnets as well. But he begins with his opening gambit, as I say, in the uh, quatrain, that although he is made of these perfect elements and the spirit sin has betrayed them both and so death must ensue it must why must it because god has ordained it so that's only uh, an elliptical reference there he is saying that it must be so but it must be so because as uh, he knows and his readers know god has declared it must be so but then he refers uh, to a, a uh, an observing party now he doesn't do it with a thou he does it with a you so there's a, an element of distance here in uh, older english the thou is used for um, intimate relations and personal relations the you is the plural the polite form the form of distance and that is how he refers to god here he's alienated to some degree he's not speaking politely he's speaking from the postulate of distance between himself and God you which beyond that heaven which was most high think of the Ptolemaic cosmology in which God is outside the ordered cosmos so beyond that heaven which was most high remember there are 10 heavens and then he's outside and beyond that you have found new spheres and of new lands can write now you could see this as a reference to the new philosophy of, of um, Copernicus or variously a few years on of Rene Descartes and the, the system of doubt and the new cosmology that goes along with that. But I think he's also uh, referring to and probably more likely referring to the idea of a new heaven and a new earth uh, referred to at the end of the book of Revelation. So he's he's uh, anticipating in this uh, that something that will be so is already so. So you which beyond that heaven which was most high have found new spheres and of new lands can write. That seems to me to be a reference to the end of the book of Revelation once again and is not a reference to uh, the disruption of the cosmology of the day as we've seen he uh, reflects upon in various 
ways in various other poems. But because of that, he says, pour new seas in mine eyes that so I might drown my world with my weeping earnestly. So given that God is the creator and he is always creating, and one day he will begin a new creation out of the old creation. He's not going to destroy. He's going to recreate. He's going to bring it up. The heavens are going to come down to the earth and restore and renew uh, what has been damaged and destroyed you which have that he says pour new seas in my eyes now he moves away from scripture here in only insofar as in that description of the new heaven and new earth in uh, revelation it states that there will be no more sea um, and i said i've said to you numerous on numerous occasions that reference in revelation to the fact that in the new heaven and the new earth there will be no more sea this is, has the connotation uh, for the sea, that a sea is a symbol of evil. By this point, it's an established symbol of evil in the Bible. It's not because God has suddenly taken a, a hostility towards salt water. It's because uh, seas have the decided connotation of uh, a force that is implacably hostile towards God. In other words, it's uh, in the throes of sin, it's the, it's the worldliness, it's the very thing that God needs to remove in order for new life to take place. Um, that's there at the end of the book of Re Revelation, but we can see it before that. And I, I'll, I'll mention these things again. So in Psalm 2, it, uh, the psalmist writes, why uh, do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain against the Lord and his almighty? Well, the word that's used for rage there is the same word that is used to describe the raging of the seas. So, and it evokes this idea of, of seas lapping at, at the um, uh, reign of God and threatening to overrule it. But of course, God, and I, I encourage you to read Psalm 2, uh, looks down upon this and laughs. And, and, uh, but this note that the seas are opposed to him is is establishing what we see quite regularly throughout the psalms that the seas are a hostile force um and and i mentioned also in in the uh, gospel accounts when the uh, jesus is in the boat with his disciples and there's a storm and uh the disciples cry out to god uh you know wake up aren't you a, aren't you a uh, disturbed that we're perishing and he tells the seas to be quiet and lie down be still with the word he pacifies the hostility towards him he also um, in a in a companion uh, passage will walk upon a, uh, the seas come out to them in the middle of a storm and he's walking on the waters. Now the word for waters there in uh, the Greek is thalassa, namely the sea. So he's walking on the sea. So the sea, which is a symbol of the restless evil, which is going to destroy the disciples who are in the boat threatening to be destroyed. He simply walks on top of the evil, expressing his dominion over it, his contempt for it, the hostility and enmity between the Lord and the restless evil that threatens to devour the people of God. And he, as I say, he puts it under his feet. And we're told in uh, later in the epistles that he will put all things under his feet, even death. These are all symbolized here in those passages. But again, the point here is that the seas have this established symbolism of a force hostile towards God. But here he's using the seas, not in that sense. He's using it simply in the sense of give him a new vision uh, in reference to simply being like tears, wash out my eyes so that I might drown my world with my weeping earnestly. Then he switches metaphors and says, or wash it if it must be drowned no more, a reference back to uh, Genesis and God's promise never to flood the earth again. Now, note he's flipping between the idea of a person and the world. But then he says, but oh, it must be burnt. 
move away from the water metaphor, let's go to the fire metaphor, but oh, it must be burnt. Alas, different types of fire. The fire of lust and envy have burnt it here to heretofore. Well, these are symbols of symptoms of, of sin. And those fires have made it fouler. But there's another type of fire, a refiner's fire, that will make it uh, better and not worse. And that is the zeal of the Lord. And he says, so burn me, O Lord, with a fiery zeal of thee and thy house, which doth in eating heal. So there is a type of fire that comes from the holiness of God rather than from the sinfulness of mankind. And that is the fire that he would uh, invoke here for his own purposes. But note the regular use on Dunn's part of elemental references, which nonetheless have biblical resonance. This is characteristics of, of Dunn's holy sonnets in general. And I think it's a good way to introduce this study of the sequence. And I'll leave it off with that.